Um, so, a provocative title, hey? HIV AIDS, a path to a cure. So let's start off with the question of um, why can't we currently cure people with HIV? Because I think it's important to actually talk about what we mean by this word, cure. So a little bit of um, background for you guys, and you may know this um, pretty well anyway. So although we can't cure people with HIV, which means basically allowing people to throw their drugs away and be you know, healthy and happy without antiretrovirals, that's not to take away from the fact that we've done some pretty damn amazing things in the 30 years since HIV was first described, incidentally, in Los Angeles. Um, we've made amazing progress. And I, I pulled out here two um, figures from very um, important publications, 10 years apart. Um, the figure on the right was uh, one of the first large-scale trials that looked at whether or not AZT worked. And who remembers AZT, OK? And you know this, uh, this sort of data, um, the little line that's going straight up um, at an angle, that's in a group of patients showing the number of what they call events that happened over time. And the time can be, you know, this is like one week, two weeks, three weeks. Every time you see a little arrow, that's because somebody died. So over the 22 weeks that they were monitoring this group of patients who were not receiving any treatment, you know, a, a lot of bad things happened. And then the other um, line, which is not quite as severe, that's the group of patients who were given AZT. So you can see straight away what an amazing difference it made. And this really revolutionized in the sort of mid-80s how we were able to treat patients. Let's move on 10 years, and over here, here's a really um, important study that came out in 1997, one of the first studies looking at the addition of protease inhibitors to a cocktail of two RT inhibitors. And um, I want to point out straight away that the two lines up there actually look pretty similar, don't they? The, uh, the black line at the top are the um, patients who receive the two RT inhibitors plus a protease inhibitor. And the dotted line underneath was the patients who were only receiving the RT inhibitors. So yeah, the addition of the protease inhibitors made a difference. But in any case, these, these patients are doing pretty well anyway, even without the PI. So this is over a period of about a year. So you can see that just in 10 years, we came a huge way that we were kind of getting excited about what really looks like quite small differences as we were perfecting the drugs that we can give people. Now. We know that one of the things that happens is when you go on antiretrovirals, your virus really takes a big hit. And this is the sort of um, graph that I'm sure you've seen before. It's showing you on, on these sort of um, x-axis, we have levels of HIV RNA in a patient's blood. And if somebody starts off with a really high level and we put them on heart, we put them on antiretrovirals, the virus drops, it plummets really rapidly. Um, and eventually it gets below this dotted line here, which is, I'm calling that the limit of detection. That just means how good we are as scientists at being able, at being able to see HIV, find HIV in somebody's blood. And initially when people um, saw this very rapid decay in the levels of virus, everybody got quite excited because they thought, okay, this line is just going to keep going down. And even though we can't see what's happening when we get down to these really low levels here, eventually the virus should just die out and people can then come off their drugs and the virus will never come back. Effectively, we expected that we would be able to cure people. And certainly, um, this is Dr. David Ho from New York. Um, he was Time Magazine's Man of the Year and I think that was 1996. And a lot of his work that was done looking at the kinetics of loss of HIV infected cells from people when they were given these drugs um, his work really got people enthusiastic and optimistic that you could take somebody who was HIV infected, hit them hard, hit them early with antiretrovirals, and eventually after one year, two years, maybe even a decade, there would be no virus left. And so people were kind of excited about this. But as you all know, that's not proved to be the case. And um, this was a paper that came out of Bob Silicano's group in 1999. And this really, I think, kind of um, put the nails in the coffin of our enthusiasm because what it showed, and this is, this is horribly complicated data, even I have to kind of stare at it for quite a long time, but it's basically that red line that's barely dipping 
is what's happening to HIV-infected T cells in patients who are on antiretroviral drugs over time. And you can see that it's hardly moving. And in this study, um, the scientists calculated that the half-life of what they're calling the reservoir of HIV-infected cells was 43.9 months. What's that? That's like three and a half years, isn't it? Um, and they calculated that even if you only had 10 to the 5 HIV-infected cells left in your body after you first start taking drugs, it would take you 60.8 years to get rid of them all. So we're really talking about a lifetime or more of taking antiretroviral drugs to get rid of every last virus, virally infected cell. And the reason that that's a problem is that if, if this isn't true, if the virus doesn't eventually die out, but instead, we have this sort of situation where even though everything has gone down to really low levels, and in many cases it's below what we can detect clinically, you, you have a situation where you've got very long-lived virus at low levels, and that's what we call a reservoir. And the problem with the reservoir is if you take somebody off their heart, the virus just comes right back up in a matter of weeks, back up to the levels it was at before the patient went on heart. So you really are looking at a lifetime of taking antiretrovirals. Okay, so let's, let's think about what the consequences of, of all this information is. So, um, you know, it, it's not all bad news. I would say that with the drugs we've got, we can extend indefinitely. Um, if, if we can extend the therapy indefinitely, then we can come close to arresting the disease or preventing symptoms in people, but we can't eradicate the virus. And that's kind of the best case scenario, because, of course, as you know, there can be further complications. For example, you know, chronic adherence to taking drugs for a lifetime is, is, is very challenging and very difficult. <laughs> You're looking at somebody here. I'm a scientist. I couldn't even take, and I couldn't even take like prenatal vitamins for nine months when I was pregnant. So I, I totally get how soul-destroying it is to be taking um, drugs every day. Drug resistance develops, even in the best um, of circumstances. And of course, these drugs are not without side effects, especially when taken over a lifetime. So there are side effects from both the drugs and the low levels of virus that are left in the body that impact on people's health. And then finally, of course, the, the influence of politics and economics. Who can get access to drugs? What's the cost? What's the availability? So all these factors really complicate the picture. And I think that's why we need a cure. So let's think about a cure. And um, I've, got, I've got to introduce you to some terminology that we use in the field, because there are two types of cures, which is kind of good, isn't it? Hopefully one of them's going to work. Um, so the first type of cure that people talk about is shown down at the bottom here. And this is called a sterilizing cure, which kind of sounds a bit painful. Um, but what it basically means is it's the idea that if we can get every last virus out of a patient's body, then they're cured. So it's a sterilizing cure. Um, that's going to be quite a challenge with HIV. The other type of cure, which is kind of the, um, the side of the field I'm on, is called a functional cure. And the idea behind a functional cure is it kind of admits that we're, we probably right now don't know how to remove every last virus from a patient's body. But instead, what we want to do is find some ways that we can make people live healthily even with a low amount of virus in their body and that they don't have to um, be taking drugs. So, let's move on to the one recorded case of somebody who's actually been cured of HIV. And you guys must all know this story by now, yeah? Yeah? You can tell us. Well, I'm going to. I've got about five slides to tell you, so. <laughs> Okay, so this is Timothy Ray Brown, also known as the Berlin patient. Um, and up at the top there, this is a headline I kept from the New York Times in 2008. Yes, I read the New York Times, even though I don't live there. And it struck me, it was like a National Enquirer headline, rare treatment is reported to cure an AIDS patient. And it was talking about um, this individual who appeared to have been cured of HIV. All right, I'm going to tell you what happened, but first of all, I'm going to teach you something. Okay, before I do that, let's see. Are there any bone marrow transplant surgeons in the audience? <laughs> okay, all right, then I can, I can fake it. All right, so 
I'm going to tell you about bone marrow transplantation. And the reason I'm telling you this is because I was actually a professor of bone marrow transplantation for five years, and I never quite understood why people needed to get bone marrow transplantations with leukemia. So if I didn't know that, I'm assuming most of you guys don't either. All right, let's go through it. This person over here has cancer. They have a, a blood cancer, a leukemia, or a lymphoma. That's that big red blob in the middle. I'm not very artistic. And what happens is when somebody has leukemia or lymphoma, you want to get rid of their cancer, you treat them with chemotherapy or radiotherapy or a combination, and it will kill the cancer. But the problem is it also kills other cells in the body, and especially these little cells down here called HSCs, hematopoietic stem cells. These are the very rare but incredibly important cells that live in, um, in your bone marrow of your long leg bones. And these are the stem cells that give rise to, that produce all the rest of your immune system, your white blood cells, your red cells, the whole of your immune and blood system. So when you give somebody who's got these cancers chemotherapy, you kill their hematopoietic stem cells. And if you didn't do anything else, sure, you've cured them of their cancer, but they're going to die in a matter of weeks or months because you've also killed their immune system. So what you have to do is, after you've given them the chemotherapy, pretty soon after that, you then have to give them a transplant of bone marrow from a donor. And the donor has to be, what we say, is a tissue-type match. Somebody who's um, either because they're a close relative, a brother or a sister, or because just coincidentally they are the same tissue type, can um, function as a donor, and their bone marrow can be given to the patient and isn't rejected, okay? Is anybody, okay, let's do this. Who here has ever registered as a bone marrow donor, even? Yay, okay, go, right. I go out and campaign for people to be donors. Ugh. All right, so the idea is after you, if you receive a bone marrow transplantation, you end up being, well, bluey gray at the end of it because your immune system is then made by the hematopoietic stem cells you received from your donor. Okay, next bit of background I want to tell you about is this thing, the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation, okay? So, first of all over here, we have a little cartoon of HIV trying to bind to and infect a T cell. And I think most people know that CD4 is important, that CD4 T cells are the things that HIV infects and kills, and that's true. Here's HIV in binding to CD4 on the surface of T cells. But HIV, you know, think of it as a virus that has kind of two feet. And in order to get into a T cell, it has to first of all put one foot on CD4, but then its other foot has to go on what we call a co-receptor molecule. And the most common and, and important co-receptor molecule is this other guy, CCR5. Now, what's significant about that is a um, fraction of the population, probably about 1%, um, don't have CCR5 on the surface of their cells. So over here, this is what CCR5 normally looks like. I kind of think it looks like a Chinese New Year dragon. It's got all those squiggles. The CCR5 Delta 32 gene is this naturally occurring mutation that some people have. And what it does is it takes a chunk out of the middle of CCR5 and makes a, a sort of a short, stumpy form of CCR5 that doesn't even get to the cell surface. And remember, you have two genes for everything. So if you have two copies of CCR5 Delta 32, what happens is you don't have any CCR5 on your cell surface. HIV comes along. It can put one foot on your T cells, but not two, and it can't get into your T cells. And therefore, if you have two copies of the CCR5 Delta 32 gene, you're profoundly resistant to HIV. Okay. And about 1% of the population are CCR5 negative or Delta 32 homozygotes, that's the technical term. Okay.